Our next guest is one of the most exciting actors of her generation. You may also have heard her arriving in a helicopter uh, a couple of hours ago. Arguably the best thing in HBO's Game of Thrones, she also starred in 2015 Star Wars, The Force Awakens, is a fashion industry muse, and perhaps most importantly, is a right laugh on a night out. Without further ado, please welcome Jonathan Heath in conversation with Gwendolyn Christie. Okay, Gwendolyn Christie is one of the finest acting talents this country has ever produced. Graduated from Drama Centre London in 2005, she began by starring in various experimental films and theatre projects, yet by 2009 she made her feature film debut with a role in Terry Gilliam's The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. In 2011, Christie was cast in a role that would transform her both personally and professionally. The role was as Brienne of Tarth in HBO's adaptation of George R. R. Martin's fantasy novel, A Song of Fire and Ice, now known to millions of fans as Game of Thrones, a show that has gone on to become the most successful television show of all time. Since landing that seminal role, she has gone on to star in The Hunger Games, Jane Campion's Top of the Lake, and has fought Jedis, Wookiees, and Rebels in the rebooted Star Wars franchise as Captain Phasma. To each role, she skillfully inhabits not only does she wield vast intellect and presence, but a rebellious, innate desire to flip perceptions and smash gender stereotypes. <sighs> this month, she's heading back on stage to appear in Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night Dream at Bridge Theatre in London. Welcome, Sir Gwendolyn of Christie. <laughs> Thank you. My work, what an intro. There you, you go. You made me laugh. <laughs> You made it sound so good. Yes, well, very impressive. <laughs> um, you're deep in rehearsals now, I believe. Yes, I am. Yeah. I am. I'm preparing to go. Hello, everybody. Let's not ignore the people in the room. <laughs> I almost want to throw sweets at the audience. <laughs> Are you having a good time? <laughs> Are you having a good time? <laughs> Yeah, someone is out of rehearsals, but isn't behaving like they're out of rehearsals. <laughs> um, I am, indeed, preparing to go back on stage again after a very long time. That's right. Um, and I'm working with the absolutely uh, astounding Nicholas Heitner, yeah. um, who has taken over the Bridge Theatre, and we are doing a production. I can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth. We're doing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream together. Um, so... That is an extraordinary experience because it is Midsummer Night's Dream interpreted in a way in which you've never really conceived. And there are some uh, fundamental changes, which will be big surprises, um, but it really will be a visual spectacular. How was it back on stage again on, in, in theatre land? Was it, were you nervous? It's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. But it's really exciting, you know, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting um, experience when you work in film and television, that you're on a film set and it's you and there's the crew and there's the cast and all the people involved. And it can be a very insular experience. And, and that's part of what makes it wonderful because you become invested and immersed in a world. Um, but in the theatre, it's all about the audience. Mm. It's all about um, contacting them and making it uh, an active experience. And particularly with um, these, this, partic this production, Midsummer Night's Dream, which is an immersive production, mm -hmm. uh, the audience are involved. So the, this is like my live tour. <laughs> um, it wasn't acting you were going to do initially, though. You were a rhythmic gymnast, is that right? That, well, I mean, when I was a child. <laughs> uh, but yes, that was my first love. Yeah. I really loved dancing, and I really loved rhythmic gymnastics because there was so much discipline. Mm. You know, there was so much that you had to learn, and then you applied emotion to it. And that was very freeing, because it felt like you were beyond anything. It felt like you were beyond any kind of particular shape. You were, you were fluid and, and moving and responding to music. And then I was growing very quickly mm. and was told that I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Okay. And I was 11 and I just decided, okay, I'll be an actor. Was, was it? Bizarre, I mean, insane. 
Insane. And still, look at how that 11-year-old decision <laughs> has shaped it's my played life. played out pretty well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, um, but was the desire, even at such a young age, to inhabit different roles or to hide from yourself? Or what was it about acting that drew you in? It was definitely both of those things. Okay. It was the idea of being able to transcend your current circumstances. Mm. Uh, I, I, it's, it's very simplistic, but I remember when I started reading, and I remember when I became a, a more advanced reading age, and being so surprised and delighted that books existed, that there was a means of being transported to another world in your own mind. And, and when I started watching television and film, which of course, you know, the likes of you and I, Jonathan, grew up in the time before the internet. <laughs> so, you know, those, those things were treasures. You yeah. know, books were treasures, so were films, so was television. And the idea of being able to escape somewhere else and take up any particular form was thrilling to me. Mm. I think also because um, I felt quite defined by the way that I looked physically, even from a young age, in the way that actually, you know, lots of people are, quite needlessly. Mm. And so the idea of becoming something else was very exciting. You're hiding in plain sight. How did you, how did you know you had it? When did it become a, a viable career? Did someone go, did pluck you out of obscurity and, and send you on your way? Or what, what happened there? How did that... I mean, out? if only. <laughs> 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 if only. Yeah. Uh, was it Bette Davis that said it only takes 15 years to make an overnight success? <laughs> it takes a lot longer than that. Um, uh, no, I, I started, I was fascinated by classical work. Yeah. When I, I'm going to just move the Madonna headset slightly away <laughs> so I stop, stop spoffing the microphone. Um, I, I, I was fascinated by classical work at a really young age. Yeah. And so I, that's, it felt like, oh, okay, that seems to be the hardest kind of, acting, the hardest form, are the classics, so that's what I need to master. Right. Um, I obviously didn't master them, <laughs> but I explored them, and then from there, I uh, took some time out when I finished my A-levels, um, because I really wanted to explore life, and then I went to drama school, yeah. and I went to Drama Centre London, which is a classical method school, and that's when it all got Serious. Yes. Right. It all w got real. Was it very competitive? In, uh, Not in the slightest. No? Not actually. between the students? Well, Drama Centre was an amazing place because it was formed on revolution. Okay. It was formed on a group of students in the 60s who had these two teachers, and their teaching methods were considered to be quite controversial. And um, because they were rooted in the method, it was about taking the method and applying it to classical work, and they favoured more obscure uh, European classics. And so um, they, the students rented a school hall mm. and said to the teachers, we want you to teach us here. And so the school was formed. And Drama Center was known as being somewhere that was built um, for outsiders. They felt that the arts were becoming elitist and that society wasn't being represented in the arts. So they wanted to take lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds. So it wasn't a money-making exercise at all. And in fact, the school really struggled, I believe, to maintain itself. And it relied on um, healthy financial contributions from people. So they took all the people that were quite unlikely, mm. you know, and, uh, and I was one of those people. Was that where you met Simon? We, Simon right? Callow and a I, mentor of yours? yeah, we weren't actually in the same year. Okay. Um, but but you've <laughs> he's a little bit older. <laughs> I know that. But uh, it is because well, it, we met. The filing. Through, we met the through filing. a lie. It was a lie. Yeah, <laughs> you know this. It was a lie. We met. I told a lie, <laughs> and I met Simon Callow. That's the way it works. Excellent. But basically, I was working with the school secretary one day, mm. and um, I. I was sort of quite in awe of her because she was so dry and intelligent and, uh, and whip smart. And I just made up a lie to try and impress her. What was that? It was an absolute idiot. I said I loved filing. <laughs> 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 but, but, I mean, God. Um, All but credit to your acting that you... 
I've, unbelievable. Well, I, I mean, know. You know. That was the first believable performance there you go. <laughs> that I gave. Because then Simon Callow rang up the school and said, I need someone to file my 40,000 compact discs. And she <laughs> said, I know just the person. <laughs> and I was elated because I'd always admired him. And a little bit of me died inside because I had to file the 40,000 compact discs. But I fell in love with Simon. And he showed me great care and mentorship. And he was one of the few people, and I, because I really respected him and I'd admired him for a long time. And he wrote this beautiful book called Love is Where It Falls, about his relationship between him and the uh, this really legendary literary agent called Peggy Ramsey, who represented Joe Wharton and, 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 and a lot of famous and controversial playwrights. Mm. And um, he also wrote this book about acting called Being an Actor. And he encouraged me. And he, he said, what he drew from me was that he said, um, child, don't be afraid to be an artist. And he gave me the courage to realize that I am ambitious and that I do want to be creative mm. and I do want to do things in a different way. And not to be ashamed of that, you know, yeah. not to to go after it. To do both. Yeah, but also um, not to accept the confines that were perhaps placed upon me. Sure. Um, Game of Thrones happened in 2011. I think let's see a little bit of Gwendolyn in action, if we may. Seven blessings. I'm Brienne of Tarth. This is Padraig Payne. You want something? I send all again. The hound. You are your stark. I asked if you wanted something. I swore to your mother I would bring you home to her. My mother's dead. I know. I wish I could have been there to protect her. You're not a northerner. No, but I swore a sacred vow to protect her. Why didn't you? She commanded me to bring Jamie Lannister back to King's Landing. You paid by the Lannisters. You're here for the bounty on me. I'm not paid by the Lannisters. No. Fancy sword you got there. Where'd you get it? I've been looking at Lannister gold all my life. Go on, Brienne of fucking Tarth. Tell me that's not Lannister gold. Jamie Lannister gave me the sword. The bloody gate's ten miles. I swore to your mother by the old gods I don't care what you swore. Oh, yeah. You had the girl. She's not coming with you. She is. You're not a good listener. A Valerian steel. I always wanted some Valerian steel. Come with me, Arya. I'll take you to safety. Safety? Where the fuck's that? Her auntie Neri's dead. Her mother's dead. Her father's dead. Her brother's dead. Winterfell is a pile of rubble. There's no safety, you dumb bitch. You don't know that by now. You're the wrong one to watch over her. And that's what you're doing? Watching over her? Aye, that's what I'm doing. Amazing, come on. I only wish we could watch the entire scene because it's so amazing. Um, I mean, that was a fun and taxing scene to film, was it not? That was completely insane. <laughs> <laughs> it happened over three days in Iceland on top of a mountain. And Rory and I trained for about three months for it. Um, and I realized that uh, on the day that it was going to be very different um, in acting the fight to how we had learnt it in the stunt tent, because in the stunt tent, it was all on one smooth level, but uh, on top of the mountain in Iceland, the I rocks. was... Well, not just that, I was uh, running backwards uphill. <laughs> <laughs> and sword fighting. <laughs> so there was that added element. But it was really thrilling, extraordinary experience. And I still can't quite believe that I did that, you know. Mm. It, we worked with such a brilliant stunt team. And Rory was so 
dedicated and incredible. He was a really generous person, really looked after you, really tried our best to look after each other. And we came away with no injuries at all, which is really remarkable. Well, it's also remarkable considering that he did demand a certain something, didn't he, of you that day? Well... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is one this is, point... This, this is method, and then there's yeah, this, Yeah, so taking it maybe to another level. There's one point where uh, the hound kicks Brienne of Tarth in quite... in a very intimate place. Yes. In the vagina. Right. Just going to say it. He kicks her in the vagina, Adawa. <laughs> he kicks her in the vagina. And, sh and Brienne responds by punching him in the testicles. And there was a leather strap there, because that's what you do, because you don't go around kicking each other in those sorts of places no. or punching each other in those sorts of places. Um, but Rory said to me, do it for real. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, do it for real. I want to feel it. <laughs> And I said, what? and I thought, well, what do I do? You know, I'm a method actress. I try and give my scene partner everything I can. And so I did it. And he kind of screamed and groaned. And they got it. And they said, great. And then he said, do it again. <laughs> and so I did it again. But we didn't seem to need to do it anymore after Good. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what an amazing role that is. I mean, it, we... You know, time is of the essence, I guess. But just explain briefly how kind of important and how much that role has transformed your life, I guess, personally and professionally. It was a really extraordinary... Um, uh, it's been a really extraordinary moment in my life, and I've been hugely lucky. I was aware, but it was very much subconsciously that there were things about myself that I wanted to explore and that I didn't want to leave alone, and I didn't want to leave unquestioned. And this part came along that I knew would force me to uh, confront my androgyny, uh, my physicality, my height, my strength, um, the inconsistencies in my face and body and and um, and you know and my and and I suppose how how sort of pale I am really and can uh, very easily look like a boiled egg. Um, these are all challenging things to confront, just as a human being. Um, but <laughs> it made me more than that. I joke, I mean, you know, more than that. It made me really question what it means to be a woman, how we are defined in society, and how we've been defined in media and in mainstream entertainment. And this seemed to be a part that allowed me to question all those things and embody those things. And I would step beyond the um, uh, classically feminized um, uh, effects of which I'd hung myself yeah. and really uh, hung on myself and really look at who I was outside of patriarchal constraints. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, a, a privilege to play that part. And it's, it, 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 has, been, it has been an evolution of self as yeah, well. Yeah. How is it? I mean, there's two more episodes to go, I believe. You're yeah. not dead yet. Yet. <laughs> um, when you look back on it, <laughs> how... <laughs> How how does it feel to look back on it now? I'm so emotional about yeah. it. Being really honest, I'm so emotional about it. It's I, I'm it's really changed my life. And actors say all the time, I'm so grateful. I'm so gra I really am grateful because this has been eight years of employment, and beyond that, it's it's felt playing that kind of role in such a successful TV show on some level has felt like acceptance. Mm. And also, it's occurred at a time where the internet has provided uh, a forum where people feel like they have an equal voice. And what people have said is that they want to see themselves represented. And I feel like this part is one small element in something larger, which is saying different sorts of people need to be on our screens. They need to be everywhere in our world. Because you see a character like Brienne of Tarth, and I didn't think that character would last because she, wasn't, she isn't conventionally attractive. And she has, and people have loved her because she... We love her for her actions yeah. rather than how attractive she might be considered to be to a heterosexual male in order to reproduce. So 
that is is why she's so important to yeah. me. Um, I mean, your role as Captain Phasma in Star Wars holds a similar kind of importance for you, um, and as a woman, I guess, is that right? Yeah, I think that. I mean, it, it it's intoxicating mm. that character. It's the idea of mystery, and what I also loved about it was that in society it's been so much for so long like Jane Campion says the boys have had it all their own way for a long time <laughs> and a lot of female roles have been about how attractive the woman is and Captain Phasma is a role it's a malevolent woman and you are denied her face yeah. and you are you have to respond to what she represents and conceptually that's really, uh, people have been really invigorated by that, and particularly um, the way children have responded to the character. Yeah. To boys and girls, or however they identify, people feel somehow that that character is about not just subverting norms, but about transcending them. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, we've discussed this before, but you have rebellion within you, bursting out. Um, Where? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, but do you enjoy kind of turning over the tables of tradition? Is that something you relish? Yeah, I've got to admit, I think I do. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's not, um, you know, I think it's only when you're put in these sorts of circumstances and you're forced to examine yourself in a way that you wouldn't normally. And so then all you can do is take that into your work. And I never thought, oh, I want to go against the norm. What the norm was saying to me is you don't have a place. Right. And I didn't feel that that was fundamentally fair. I also didn't think it was very interesting because I kept seeing the same sorts of stories and representations again and again. And I wanted to see something else. And I still now, I don't think, I don't think oh, I want to rebel and I want to do things differently. I just want to uh, be able to express myself in its purest form without feeling that it's confined in a way to make it more palatable or marketable. Mm. And I, I think there's a, a greater capability of pure expression from people than what we've seen. Um, but yeah, I think I also like to deliver the two-fingered salute. <laughs> um, do you think things are really... I mean, there's a lot of talk of flux um, within Hollywood. Are things really changing, though, from what you've seen? I think things are starting to change, yeah. but I don't think it's anything that we can take for granted. I think what we're seeing in Hollywood specifically is that different sorts of films make a lot of money. And so Wonder Woman uh, was a film with a lot of female characters and um, what was considered to be a subverted storyline from um, the sorts of super superhero movies that we'd received before. And it made a huge amount of money. And so, and Black Panther made a huge amount of money. And both of those films felt incredibly refreshing to watch and they had great stories and they were really entertaining. But I think like anything, you have to keep the pressure up. What we're talking about is a system that's been in place since, since the birth of humankind. And in order to enter an area where we feel things are a bit more equal, there's, uh, there's, m there's greater differences, we, we see things explored that aren't necessarily tr traditional, we have to keep that pressure up. Absolutely. But I think it's working. I feel positive about it. Well, I mean, as long as we can see more of you on our screens, I think, Gwendolyn, we'll all be very happy. Oh, Jonathan. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're out of time, and that's really sad, but thank you so much, Gwendolyn and Christy, for thank you. us today. Thank you.